But still, it's the ironmongery of this great business that absorbs Mike Sato. The locomotives, their hisses and snorts to be recorded here and recollected in tranquility. WPT, one of the prototype WP class built by Baldwin, of which there are seven left, headed at Faisabad, and number 7208 comes in to Varanasi Cantonment Station. And this one happens to be drawing behind it uh, one of the standard tenders because I see the bogeys are. Udaipur was once a princely state of great prestige and renown. The Lake Palace is now a tourist hotel of equally great prestige and renown, perhaps the loveliest in India. There in the middle of the Pichola Lake in an unspoiled town with the Dobie Guts coming down to the water's edge, you would think you had everything. But Mike Sato dreams only of trains. Ram Kumar, the curator of the museum, had only recently been appointed, and there was much to show him. You can't uh, learn everything by just looking into dusty files. I took him around with me on several visits. One of the more exciting ones, I think, from his point of view, was the monorail at Patiala. But there's the engine shed, and the track coming in here, and another track over there. Here's the remains of one of the uh, passenger coaches. And here is Colonel Bowles' saloon, with some of the original paintwork and lining on it, so we can get all that. And then up at the front here, we've got the engines. Let's go and have a look at those for a start. This one's very good, but unfortunately, the boiler's missing off this one, and I can't find it anywhere at all. They're in splendid condition, you know, because these things haven't worked for 47 years. We've even got the original uh, lettering on the side of these things. Uh, what is this PSMT? It's the Patiala State Monorail Trainway. What is the history of this monorail? Well, it was built in 1907 for the Maharaja by Colonel Bowles. And it ran for 20 years, came into this engine shed, never ran again. All that's happened is the rails have been buried by wind-borne dust. Trees have grown up round the track over there between two wagons. But apart from that, the climate's so good, you see, that everything has been preserved very well indeed. You see, the principle of the, this monorail was for temporary light railways, for building factories, moving materials about on construction sites. And they were never in one place for more than about one month. And it didn't really matter what the condition of the ground was like. You see, it only had the one rail under the centre. And the weight was about 90% on the rail, 10% on this wheel, which ran on the road to steady it. But after 20 years going over the same track, it got into a fair amount of difficulty because of the grooves worn by the uh, iron wheel here. Are there any such other uh, systems in other countries? Not this system. This system was only used in India. The engines, these engines themselves, came from Berlin. They're on Stein and Koppel. The main thing you see now is, having found it, we've got an opportunity of saving it. I don't mind how long it takes to uh, get it put back into working order. The important thing is that anything as historic as this just should not be cut up and sold for scrap. But, you know, if we could get this thing to Delhi, lay, lay a bit of this track, because there obviously is still plenty of track in the yard here. If we could do that, this would be an absolute winner. It really would. Indians are great travellers within their own land. Some of them, you'd think they almost lived on trains. The vast bulk of them travel hard, third class, for hours and hours and days and days. Pay 
patience. Patience is the thing. And no one has more of that than the Indians. We shall arrive sometime, somewhere. We always do. <laughs> An Indian railway station is more than a stopping place. It is, in fact, a way of life. Indian people don't go to railway stations. They inhabit them, sometimes literally so. The station is a social centre, a nexus of life, a bazaar, an island of activity in the midst of 800,000 villages where you can come by almost anything you want, from an orange to a bangle. It may be a couple of days or three before your train is due, so what can be the hurry? In the meantime, on the station, one plays, waits, lives, waits some more while time slips by, washes, eats, sleeps, reflects on eternity. Above all, wait. Even on the track there are pickings to be made. Even cinders are not without value in a poor country. And Indian railway values and economics are not to be judged by Western standards. Of course, there are hundreds and thousands of ticketless travellers every day. The railways tolerate them. What else could they do? Banaris on the Ganges is the holiest place on the holiest river for all pious Hindus. At sunrise, it is a place for the cleansing of the soul. Yet this peculiarly sacred place is one of the major centers of the Indian railways. Most of the pilgrims come to Benares by train, after all, from all over India to this especially hallowed riverside, where one washes away one's spiritual impurities in the Ganges, though perhaps acquiring a few physical ones in the process.
tireless Mike Sato is still at work, still busy on the enshrining of the great Indian railway system on film, and tape and memory, and coaxing the powers that be not to forget what the railways were all about. India, one finds uh, amongst the great family of railwaymen the generosity and kindness which has been so much a tradition of railwaymen. You find drivers who will invite you onto their footplate and quite frequently extend that hospitality beyond that of the footplate and even into their own homes. It's very, very kind of you to ask me to this this festival because I've never been inside a family house during a Diwali oh, yeah. festival before. And this is really the Hindu New oh, Year. Yes. New Hindu yes. Year. New Hindu so we year. Uh, yes. everything we start today. Yes. Diwali is in fact the autumn festival of lights when every Hindu home is aglow in honor of the coronation of Rama, the god king or the king god who could possibly know after 2000 years. It's dedicated to Lakshmi, goddess of prosperity, so every little lamp and light is auspicious for both this world and the next. Now we really take to the hills. This is what the true railway buffs all wait for, the famous Darjeeling Himalaya Railway. This is the spectacular little toy train with its two-foot gauge scrambling up the mountains on gradients sometimes one in twenty, chasing its own tail in extraordinary loops and curlicues. A single line track with all the down trains going one after the other and then all the up trains going up. Sometimes the track is too steep even to go in loops, so the train has to reverse itself onto a new level, while the one five minutes behind busily pursues it.
It takes eight hours to do its 54 miles, and it isn't always quicker by rail. Not when you can hop off at one side of the loop and hop back again on the other. You learn these techniques only through experience. At the little hill town of Kursiong, the little hill train runs smack down the middle of the main street. This is road rail integration of the closest kind. For a while, the train is a tram. For all little hill towns, the train is an event, an occasion. It is the train that links these remote places with everywhere else. This is quite particular. For Mike Sato, a special little train as befits a specialist. An observation coach for the number one connoisseur of all Indian trains and the Himalayan toy train in particular. How many of the B-class engines are still working? All 25 of them are 25, working. 25, they're all working. And online we have 16 of them. Every so often, of course, some disaster strikes this railway. The monsoon washes away large sections of the track. And every time this happens, those of us who love it feel this must be the final death knell of the railway, which, after all, is losing money to the extent of 75% of its operating costs. But there are strong arguments in keeping it alive. First of all, if it were closed, 2,000, 2,500 people would be without a job in an area which certainly can't provide alternative employment. But even on the emotional side, or the more emotional side, as seen by the railway enthusiast, this is surely one of the most famous, one of the best known of these hill railways. I don't think anybody could fail to be moved by the excitement of the toy railway as it's called up to Darjeeling. It's always known in the most friendly fashion as the toy railway. And for 54 miles this exciting little railway plods uphill over the top at Goom, right on top of the world because when you come through Goom and into the famous double loop at Batasia you get your first glimpse of the snow and Kanchenjunga looming behind Darjeeling which at that point lies about 600 feet below you. Now the downward coasting ride towards Darjeeling. Darjeeling, one of the famous hill stations of the high northeast, squashed in at 7,000 feet between Sikkim and Nepal, almost within the shadow of Everest. It is possible to find parts of India that aren't within the bullock cart's ride of a railway line, but it isn't easy. <laughs> India is so big, so various. Fifteen recognized languages and uncountable dialects, which could well have been a great balkanized confusion had the railways not, in their long, lumbering way, united it. Wherever you are in India, when the train comes, everything stops for the train.
And when the train is gone, India takes over again. It isn't very beautiful, really, but it is beautiful. And because it's part of life, it isn't immortal. This will go one day, unless Mike Sato and his friend succeed and insist that it shall not go or at least not go unrecorded and unsung. Much for the Indian railways and their splendid steam locomotives. The future of railways all over the world is very much in doubt, but so far as private railways are concerned and preserved lines, steam is with us still and likely to be so. So here's to the next time.